Welcome to today's virtual event, Learning from our COVID-19 Response to Build Resilient Communities, co-hosted by Evidence for Action, or E4A, and the National League of Cities. We are thrilled that you are all here to join us for this robust conversation. My name is Maylin Tan. I'm Assistant Deputy Director for E4A. E4A is a grant-making program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Our mission is to support research about what works to advance racial equity and improve population health, and to make sure that this evidence is used for decision-making. We award grants for innovative, rigorous research on how to advance health and racial equity and reduce disparities in health and well-being outcomes for people and communities of color. E4A funded Dr. Julia Raifman, one of the panelists that you'll hear from today, and her project team to develop the COVID-19 U.S. State Policy Database, or CUSP, to document and track the health and social policies implemented during COVID-19 and its economic ramifications. Now that the CUSP database is compiled, we're really excited to host this event to provide insight on how elected or appointed policymakers and staff who are addressing COVID-19 recovery and future resiliency efforts can apply lessons from the various COVID-19 response measures and examine ways to coordinate with different levels of government to build more resilient communities amid the ongoing pandemic and beyond. I'm pleased to introduce the National League of Cities as our co-host for this event. And joining me from NLC is Stephanie martinez Ruckman, the Legislative Director for Human Development. Thank you, Stephanie, for being such an incredible thought partner for this event. And I'd like to pass the mic over to Stephanie to say a few words. Thanks so much, Maylin. Uh, NLC is so happy to partner with Evidence for Action today on this important conversation. And welcome to everyone who's joined us. Um, since March 2020, uh, city leaders have really been at the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, working collaboratively with their county, state, and federal partners <clears throat> to ensure that our communities remain safe and healthy. And so from addressing the immediate public health concerns of access to masks and tests and vaccines, uh, local leaders have also been addressing things like the social determinants of health and other community impacts that this pandemic has, has had on our cities, uh, towns, and villages. So today, as leaders continue to address those impacts of COVID, they're also thinking about how the lessons learned from our responses to COVID will impact ongoing work um, in public health space and beyond. So today's conversation could not be more timely. Um, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you all today's moderator and a true partner in this work, um, Eduardo Cisneros. Eduardo uh, serves as the Intergovernmental Affairs Director for the COVID-19 Response Team at the White House. Um, and prior to the White House, uh, he worked at Altamed Health Services, one of the nation's largest federally qualified health centers on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before that, um, he worked with SCIU Healthcare in Washington, DC, and he also served in the Obama-Biden administration as a special assistant, sec a special assistant to the secretary um, and associate director of intergovernmental affairs at the US Department of Labor. Um, so we are thrilled to have him um, in the White House as our partner and moderating this conversation here today. Um, so Eduardo, I'll now pass this over to you to help us introduce our speakers and begin uh, today's conversation. Awesome, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, it's good afternoon, it's great to be with you all. Thanks for having me uh, for this very important conversation. I'm excited to, to moderate. Um, this is uh, uh, learning from our COVID-19 response to build uh, resilient communities. And so again, thanks for having me um, on the COVID uh, response team here at the White House, um, which um, we are certainly at a much different place now in the pandemic than we were uh, when the pandemic started, uh, in large part due to the um, various tools in our arsenals uh, to respond to the pandemic, uh, vaccines, um, th treatments, therapeutics, et cetera. Uh, we're excited that, uh, or, or pleased that deaths and hospitalization rates um, continue to remain uh, you know, pretty low. Um, but, but that all said, um, we've all seen how unpredictable this pandemic has been. Um, and as we're seeing, for instance, with monkeypox um, and other um, kind of public health threats, we wanted to make sure to take an opportunity to, uh, to pause and, and, and reflect and learn um, and share best practices. So. Uh, again, just uh, um, you know, just further uh, uh, reason why we were um, having this conversation, and, and thank you to uh, Evidence for Action and National Leagues of Cities for uh, for bringing us together. 
Um, I could not uh, think of a better group of, of panelists and speakers to, to join us for this uh, conversation uh, than the folks that you have um, on the line here, uh, including Dr. Reifman, developer of, um, of CUSP um, and other uh, panelists that will be uh, sharing their uh, lessons learned, um, as well as um, thoughts on future um, you know, pandemic responses uh, or, or public health threats uh, responses. Um, these leaders um, on, the, on the line have been responding to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on top of, of course, building on uh, equity efforts, uh, serving our most uh, medically underserved um, and bu building uh, resilient communities overall. So um, again, really, really talented group. Um, I will go ahead and start to uh, introduce some of these, um, some of our panelists, um, starting with uh, Dr. Uh, Julia uh, Reifman, um, assistant professor at Boston University School of Public Health and developer of uh, the COVID-19 U.S. State Policy Database, or as we call it, or uh, the group calls it, uh, CUSP. Uh, Dr. Reifman conducts research on how health and social policies shape public health and health disparities. Um, she's created uh, and leads CUSP, tracking more than 200 state policies to prevent COVID-19 and to reduce economic hardship. Uh, her research on unemployment insurance and food insufficiencies helped inform uh, the American Rescue Plan and she is also a collaborator on a study indicating that lifting state eviction freezes uh, was associated with increased COVID-19 cases and deaths, uh, a finding that helped uphold the federal eviction moratorium until the fall of 2021. She's also written extensively about reducing uh, disparities in access to vaccines, rapid tests, and high quality masks, and about data-driven mask policies as a potential long-term strategy to reduce the pandemic's disruptions to lives, health, and the economy. Uh, we're also joined by um, another uh, partner in, in our jurisdictions, uh, Barbie Robinson, uh, who I've had the pleasure of, of working with. Uh, she currently is the executive director of Harris County Public Health. Uh, director Robinson has over 27 years of experience in healthcare administration, policy, research, and has been recognized as a leading, uh, has been recognized for her, her leadership in leading collaborative efforts to address health disparities. Uh, health improvement and health equity throughout her career. She currently serves as executive director of uh, the uh, Harris County Public Health, a nationally accredited county public health agency uh, for the nation's largest, uh, third largest county serving a population of approximately 5 million people. Um, but uh, prior to that, and I'm a Californian uh, by uh, originally, so she prior to that, she served as director of Sonoma County Department of, um, of Health Services uh, in California for five years where she led uh, the county's COVID-19 response and oversaw the public health response during the wildfires of 2017, 2019, 2020, and also oversaw the response to the county's largest homelessness uh, encampment in 2020. So really pleased to have her as well. Good to see you, Director Robinson. Um, also joining us is Tim Robb, uh, another jurisdictional partner that's been key to our administration's efforts, uh, director currently of strategic initiatives at the Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak's office. Uh, he previously served as the uh, Nevada State Pandemic Response Coordinator for the governor's office, as well as the COVID-19 Response Coordinator for the Nevada Department of Health and Human Services. Um, throughout, his throughout, his, uh, throughout the pandemic, he's led several efforts, uh, key efforts in partnership with the federal government uh, as well, uh, including um, Vax Nevada Days um, and GOTV Vax or, or GOT Vax, a uh, partnership that we did uh, together with the federal government and FEMA uh, deploying strike teams to um, reach uh, folks in the communities uh, regarding vaccines and vaccine education. He's also helped secure at home rapid COVID tests for Nevadans uh, and has ensured community partners were ready and able to help with the distribution. Currently, as Director of Strategic Initiatives, uh, Rob also convenes experts and program professionals to identify issues and build on long-term strategies to address them and to stand up programs to address specific needs of uh, Nevadaans um, in, uh, in the state of Nevada. So uh, also very, very pleased um, to have him joining us on this panel. Uh, we will be joined um, by Mayor Elorza of the great city of Providence, Rhode Island uh, in a few minutes. Um, but uh, while um, we wait for him, I'm gonna go ahead and. Uh, get us started on uh, question number one and kind of level set a little bit of the conversation um, and then we'll pause uh, to introduce the mayor once he once he joins uh, has also been a phenomenal um, leader um, to our pandemic response and just uh, a key um, jurisdictional leader on the ground 
So for question number one, uh, to the group here uh, and to our uh, attendees as well, um, what COVID-19 public health protection measures or prevention strategies were more uh, most effective versus most embraced? So uh, prevention strategies most effective versus most embraced. Um, as a follow-up to that, if we have to make trade-offs, should we try to make strategies people embrace more effective or should we try to convince people to embrace the most effective strategies that we have? So a little bit of a, a dilemma that I know that this group is certainly um, kind of dealt with uh, firsthand um, in the field. So um, I'll uh, turn to some of our panelists and if okay with you, Director Robinson, I'll start with you. Thank you for that question. I would say, um, depending on where we are in the pandemic, right, the, the strategies and interventions that were most effective changed. Um, in the early days, um, uh, the orders um, canceling mass gatherings and stay at home orders were really effective because a novel virus um, uh, with high transmissibility in the community, um, it was really important for us to uh, put in place those measures that created the social contract for us to um, you know, uh, encourage and support everyone in protecting each other from the spread of the virus. So I will say um, the orders that we put in place, um, uh, it's the inverse relationship. They were perhaps the most unpopular, the most, un, you know, uh, challenging for communities, but they were the most effective and um, under the circumstances, you know, necessary in order to save lives. Great, thank you so much, Director Robinson. Um, Dr. Reifman, thoughts there? Most effective versus most embraced policies that we saw? Yeah, thank you for your kind introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, so what we see based on the evidence is that mask mandates and vaccine mandates are the most effective policies with the lowest cost to society. Um, like Dr. Robinson was saying, uh, I, what, what has happened is that we have learned more about how the virus spreads. We know it spreads through the air and that masks reduce spread and wearing masks together works most effectively to ensure that the people with COVID are wearing masks and the people around them. Um, now we can deploy our most effective policies strategically. So they're not in place at all times, but we reduce the concentrated health and economic harms that happen in really bad surges. Um, we do expect the pandemic to continue. Even now, we see more people are dying every day than die of car accidents or suicide, which were already leading causes of death. Um, and we do expect more bad surges to happen, but we can be prepared. Um, so what we suggest is following an approach piloted by Nevada. Uh, so I'm so glad to have uh, Dr. Rob here today. Um, and we suggest data-driven mask mandates that turn on when transmission is high. So everyone knows the rationale for when policies turn on and when they turn off. Um, the start of a new surge is also a good time to implement a vaccine or booster mandate. We see that more people will get vaccinated and boosted at the beginning of surges. And it's a good time to take advantage of that momentum to help people do something that they may have intended to do but haven't gotten a chance to do yet. The start of a new surge is also um, uh, it's something that moves very quickly. So it's important to have a plan in place before a surge begins. Um, and one thing that has been working well for some cities is to have the um, start of an increase in cases or an increase in wastewater, an increase in test positivity, trigger a decision-making meeting so that you can decide what to do based on the available data. It's also important to realize there's not a federal policy plan. So you wanna develop your own plans for your cities. Uh, to take an even stronger approach, a group of cities could join together to decide on vaccine and mask policies as a group. You can also come together to give feedback to higher levels of government to say what would be helpful to support you, what kind of evidence could they share so that the public knows that there's a strong rationale for the policies you're implementing. Um, and if you would like to discuss a coordinated approach with other cities, we're also happy to facilitate that and engage with cities. So. Um, if you want to chat me or if you want to email me at jraithman at bu.edu, we're happy to get those discussions going. Um, and we saw that work really well in, in the Bay Area, for instance, but I think it's something we could do much more broadly. Great. Thank you, Dr. Reifman. Uh, Dr. Rob, we'd love to hear your thoughts there, given uh, the innovation and leadership in Nevada. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, and I apologize. I'm not a doctor. I am just the director. So I, I appreciate the confidence there. But um, I think that really one of the strategies we found most effective is really localizing the, the implementation of how this is going to work with um, any infection prevention strategy. Um, so whether that's within a county, a city, um, or even as far down as a, a specific type of um, long-term care facility, 
um, we found that really building those, um, those infection prevention strategies to meet the specific needs and also be um, accepted by the people um, that, that work and live within those environments is really the, the way that we found most effective to prevent hospitalizations, deaths, um, and, and cases, but, but we know that cases are going to come. So really the, the, the main focus was to ensure that as many people as possible were kept out of our hospital systems um, and also um, just ensuring that the, the impacts on our communities was not as great as it could be um, had those, those strategies not been in place. Um, I think communication is always important and really telling people what the, um, what the risks are if they don't choose to, to adhere to the, the mitigation measures that we wanna put in place, um, as well as just ensuring that they know um, what the, the proper things are to do. Um, with this novel response, we had all kinds of changing guidance throughout the pandemic and uh, making sure that they were up to date in a way that was efficient and effective was also something that we really strive to do. Um, and, and sometimes we did better than others, but I think we've always learned every step of the way how to do it better the next time. Um, so those are the big things on my side, I think, for, for question one. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, uh, Director Rob. Um, and you touched on, on communication, and I think that's one of the things that we talk about kind of embraced versus effective. Um, sometimes we can uh, do our best uh, effort to uh, communicate effective uh, mitigation measures, for instance, but not always the one that resonates or is embraced by, by folks. Just we'll, we'll get to, I think, uh, communications and, and kind of communi uh, successful communication strategies uh, to, the, to the general public. But in your experience, I'd love just as a, as a follow up to. Uh, this question, uh, your guys' is kind of just top kind of, you know, uh, knee jerk reactions to what was most helpful. Um, I think we saw everything from uh, daily press conferences to door to door knocking to PC, uh, PSAs and uh, Facebook, et cetera. Um, would love to kind of just get your guys' thoughts in terms of just uh, while it's fresh on your mind as we think about most embraced uh, policies, what was uh, your guys' uh, kind of uh, if you had to choose kind of your top um, effort uh, in terms of communicating with uh, your constituencies. Uh, let's go with uh, Director Robinson. Yeah, I would say our uh, uh, being able to uh, go on social media on a daily basis and communicate um, the status of our efforts, whether it was the initial days of putting in our mitigation strategies and educating the public on why uh, those strategies were necessary. I think we, we, we reached a broader uh, population um, versus the traditional forms of communication that local government uh, typically puts in place. So I think it was a very effective and a way for folks in real time uh, to communicate directly um, with um, uh, government officials and have their questions answered directly. Great. Um, Director Rob. Yeah, so I think the most uh, efficient communication method is the one that people are going to see. And I think that we in Nevada at least have very diverse populations that get their information through many different channels. Um, I think that one of our more effective strategies is finding those trusted community partners to be that messenger on our behalf and get the information to the people that they serve, um, whether that's a faith-based organization, um, somebody that's used to doing things like get out the vote, um, which is kind of how we modeled our get out the vaccine mission with FEMA um, and a lot of federal, state, local partners um, to ensure that that was successful. That was incredibly targeted. We went zip code by zip code and actually left pamphlets on the doorsteps of individuals with a place to go that day. So um, really facilitated that, that very targeted messaging, um, but then also making sure that that broad messaging is getting out there as well. So that, that was done through social media, through email campaigns, through um, really any, any type of strategic communication method we could find, um, we deployed as best as we could. Um, and, and our team actually continues to get rewarded for that through a lot of the, the advertising and marketing um, associations across the nation. So that's a pretty exciting thing, but we, we continue to wanna get the message out um, in any way that's possible. Um, that could be expensive, so that was a challenge throughout the pandemic and really making sure that we were able to identify the funds that would get to the right places. Um, but we, we did and we continue to ensure that our communication methods are as broad as possible. Great, great. Thank you. No, that's, uh, that's great. And we certainly have seen uh, the need for uh, all of a variety of different uh, tactics to reach people uh, where they're at. Um, and, and certainly uh, none of those efforts went without some uh, 
you know, uh, challenges and, and, and in, in fact, uh, criticism. I, I do recall, uh, Director Rob, when we started door to door, there were some folks that uh, were really up in arms about us uh, kind of uh, visiting uh, people at their homes to discuss, uh, you know, vaccine efforts, for instance. And so uh, understanding that uh, is a balancing act there in terms of reaching people where they um, they are um, and, and kind of dealing with some of the um, kind of, um, you know, pushback or, or challenges that exist out there. And I, I suspect that goes also first as we've seen uh, social media as well. So both, both as people are getting accurate um, kind of um, tr uh, you know, truthful information, they're also seeing a lot of uh, misinformation out there as well. So um, thank you all for your guys' uh, leadership there. Um, Dr. Reifman, any thoughts there on just kind of the, the various channels that we had uh, deployed um, to, to reach people where they're at? Um, and then I think we have a question for perhaps uh, best suited for you in the, in, the, in the chat box around the foundation for um, kind of data uh, for uh, effective um, uh, masking policies. But um, I'd love your thoughts on kind of just the first question around um, the, 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 what you've seen in terms of uh, the, the various kind of uh, channels that we've used to communicate with folks um, where they're at. Yeah, great. Uh, so I, I think we've seen that I, I actually love the crisis um, and emergency response manual from the CDC published last in 2014. Um, and those principles have really held true through crises through the years, including the COVID crisis. Um, and those principles are to be first, be right and be actionable. Uh, those are the first three principles. And the, the be first element is really because we actually expect misinformation and disinformation to, to reach people. Um, and the most effective way to help inform people is to actually reach them first before the misinformation or disinformation reaches them. Um, now, I think we've also seen it um, be really hard for public health directors to be able to, um, to be able to execute on that. Sometimes there are political constraints. And I think what it's important to realize is that, um, that the public health directors really have uh, the best sense of, um, of what we should be communicating, um, just how much we should communicate concern and, and not to minimize or exaggerate the risk of, of what is to come, but to help people be prepared. Um, and, and if we keep public health directors quiet because we, um, you know, it's, it's just not, <laughs> um, it's not very happy news that a surge is coming, you know, ultimately the costs uh, become apparent to everybody. The surge comes, the, um, the people's health and services and schools and businesses and the economy and healthcare workers, it's all disrupted. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think that we have to work together to strengthen our institutions so that um, public health directors at all levels of government can speak first, um, can speak um, to the right information, be transparent about it, not minimize it or exaggerate it, and can help people take the necessary actions. We still uh, need a lot more people to get vaccinated and boosted in the United States. We're far behind other countries. We have very large income disparities. Um, and, and we do need layered mitigation and surges. Um, and we can make the case for that if we can get out the facts um, and, and try to uh, preempt some of that misinformation and disinformation. Excellent, thank you. Um, the, the, the question we got in the chat box, uh, somewhat uh, related, but um, as we kind of think about uh, seeking to implement um, effective uh, masking measures, um, the question is centers around kind of what is the foundation or how best to kind of establish the foundation of that data, uh, particularly given the, the, the prevalence of, of over-the-counter tests and kind of the lack of, of visibility on some of, um, of that. Um, welcome, any thoughts? And we'll probably end up getting to this at a second question as well, but I would love, since it's, uh, it was dropped in the chat box here, would love any reaction there. Yeah, I would, I, I would love to hear more detail about the Nevada experience, um, you know, and I think this is a policy innovation where we have a lot to learn, and that's part of what we should communicate to the public. Um, but I do think that when we see an increase in whatever data we have, a lot of policy analysis is based on what's happening to the trends. So we may be only capturing a fraction of people in the PCRs, but if we start, see that trend start to increase, if we see test positivity start to increase, if we see wastewater start to increase, those are important signs that we should be ready to act because it grows exponentially, right? We all saw that with the Omicron BA1 surge, it moves really quickly. And you wanna take decisive action early to reduce that exponential spread. If you stop it here, then you know it's already, um, it's already underway that it's already spreading to several other people from each person who's infected. Uh, and so, um, so we have seen metrics of about a 50% increase over a week, um, have, have worked well for some cities. 
Um, you know, and I, th I think that is something that we could explicitly work to learn more about um, and that cities could decide what is right for them. But I do think that you that relying on case data rather than hospitalization or death data is important because by the time the hospitals are overflowing, by the time um, we have a lot of people dying, it, it, we already are too late to act. Um, so you really want to rely on those as the earliest indicators. It also means it's really important for us to have reliable data on cases and on uh, wastewater. So improving the surveillance capability is important. That's great, that's great. And you, uh, Dr. Reif, you, you mentioned uh, wastewater as well. So as, as more uh, kind of approaches also um, emerge, I think that uh, it sounds like that would also be helpful as we get more uh, visibility on efforts like, like surveilling uh, wastewater. Uh, but I saw Director um, uh, Rob um, thought go on mute. So I'd love if you have any thoughts here uh, and then we can uh, continue down uh, with, the, with our second question. Director Rob? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think part of where we landed on, on how we turned on and off mask mandates within Nevada, um, within county specifically, was really based on how, how cultures were accepting masks, but also um, where the, the need was. So we ensured that we were looking at test positivity. So we knew that the communities had as much testing as was needed to ensure that they, they were catching cases as quickly as possible. Um, but then also looking at case data, um, death data, hospitalizations, all of it in, com in, in com combination um, to develop the metrics that we use to turn on and off those, um, those mask mandates. We also did it on a lagging type of um, on and off switch that was a two week variation. So if you were in one category for two weeks, you could take them off and another you could take, put them back on. Um, and we wanted to make sure that that was in place to ensure that there wasn't confusion on whether or not there was masks available and that there was time to prepare and understand what was coming um, if they were um, going to continue to see the transmission levels that they were during different time periods. So um, I think that that's probably in a nutshell where we came up with our strategy and, and how we tied it to data. Um, but I think that that was a really effective way that we were able to work through uh, making sure that communities that didn't have significant spread were not um, we're not in masks and then also ensuring that those that needed them um, did have them in place and that they were mandatory. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Oh, Dr. Eichmann? Yeah, just to follow up, I think that two week approach was really smart. Um, we do, did see some other places that implemented data driven mask mandates where it'd be on one day and off the next day and that was very confusing to everyone. So having that two week period was very helpful for ensuring that the trends were stable before turning the mask policy on or taking the policy off. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, just a, a quick uh, reminder that uh, feel free to drop um, kind of comments or questions into the chat boxes uh, uh, if you're able to. Um, I personally am excited to be able to do that because our White House computers don't normally allow for it. So I'm kudos to Evidence for Action for figuring out how I can access the chat box again. Uh, but uh, with that, let's, uh, we'll continue to move on. Uh, the next question, uh, while uh, masking as a mitigation measure was critically important uh, in our pandemic response, We'd love your thoughts on examples of other successful either social or economic emergency measures, um, eviction moratoriums, payroll protection, paid leave, child tax credit, et cetera, uh, that you all think would be maybe um, well suited to institutionalize uh, or to put in place um, to better prepare us for future disease outbreaks and to avoid kind of the scramble uh, for future emergencies. Um, I would love uh, your thoughts here and I'll turn or I'll pause here and see if uh, Director Robinson has any uh, reaction here. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so it, I, oh, sorry, go sorry, ahead. I didn't know if it was, oh, I didn't know. If, sorry, go for it. It's all you. Go for it. I think you're better suited to answer this one than I may be. Yeah, I think it's really important uh, to keep messaging around uh, how COVID magnified the challenges and the systemic barriers that exist within our communities that, um, you know, perpetuate dis health disparities. And so in this instance, whether it was COVID, whether it's a natural disaster, Sonoma County is prone to national di natural disasters, Harris County natural disasters, and we see the same outcomes over and over again. And so I think it's really important, not so much for short-term interventions, but rather looking at um, those interventions that will systemically change uh, the trajectory and the disparities that we see in communities that have been marginalized, underserved, um, with poor outcomes. How do we address the social determinants of health so that we don't see these types of disproportionate impacts and disparities? So while we can highlight the importance of utility assistance or being poised and prepared to provide that or rental assistance or mortgage assistance or childcare assistance, 
we really need to be thinking about how do we change uh, foundationally those, um, those systems um, and, and structures that uh, create or, or magnify and perpetuate these kinds of um, disparities and outcomes. Great, thank you. Um, Jim, would love your thoughts. I know you were uh, uh, unmuted earlier. Would, uh, any reaction there as well would be welcomed. Yeah, I know. I think that there's, there's no one size fits all to any emergency response. And I think that that was evident here as well. Um, I think that we continue to change our strategies and and how we were addressing the challenges that were brought at each stage of the pandemic. I think that we had very, very good effective messaging to our small businesses um, that I think we could probably build on in the future and also help them be more resilient, but then also help those large employers within our state to make sure that they have the resources and access to the things that they need to keep their workforce and um, their employees in a position that it's effectively um, helping them adjust the challenges that they may see in their specific world. So um, I think that there's just a, a continuation in making sure that we um, do things that are specific to the task at hand that are needed, and then also building more resiliency in our long-term approaches to how we work through things. So. Uh, Dr. Reifman, thoughts there? And, and some of these were I talked about um, as emergency measures to put in place in response to the pandemic, but I think uh, both directors make really good points around um, kind of addressing longer term health disparities and addressing social determinants of health overall. Um, uh, would love your thoughts there. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, and I think there's so much to learn from the policy response to the pandemic and the unprecedented data collection during the pandemic, because so much of what we learned from those data are actually things that happen to people every day, right? So um, what the pandemic revealed is a reality that has long been true that many Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And if they miss their paycheck, they um, due to unemployment or to illness or to a natural disaster, then they're immediately in, in trouble, right? They don't have enough to eat. They um, don't have enough to pay rent. Um, and that can have significant ramifications on you know, child development um, and on their economic stability going forward, on the community's economic stability going forward. Um, and we saw that children in households um, that were affected by the pandemic were, were especially vulnerable to food and housing insecurity. Um, and so it's always been a problem that we don't have unemployment insurance that cover, it actually covers fewer people than it does cover, um, covers only 25% of people who lose work. Um, we also don't have paid sick leave in the United States. And, and we just did some new research that shows that uh, people who are lowest income, people who are less, earning less than $50,000 in household income in 2019 were 12 times more likely to miss work during the pandemic on average than people earning more than $200,000. Um, so the people who are lowest income are being hit hardest by the continuing pandemic. Um, they often don't have paid leave, often don't have enough food to eat when they're sick, and it's happening again and again, in addition to being harmed by like health and um, hospitalization and other ramifications of COVID itself. Um, so I think we need some resilience policies like paid sick leave, like the expanded child tax credit that was very effective for reducing child poverty. Um, and like expanded unemployment insurance in all times. Um, we really need these resilience policies to set us up um, and set up our population to be able to thrive, in, especially in the more volatile context of COVID. Um, and, and that is contributing to things like high inflation that are, are um, increasing economic hardship right now. Um, we also learned about the importance of setting up like crisis response policies. The worst peaks in food and housing insecurity were right as the pandemic started. Um, and that will be true. It will always be true that that crisis moment in a disaster or um, of any kind will lead to that really big spike in economic hardship as well. Um, and so we can prepare for that. And I think policy should be part of our toolkit. So we did see that eviction freezes worked really well to help families avoid the worst. Um, that rent support helped families avoid the worst, right? And, and that helps protect them against um, something that can have years long ramifications for them and their households. So I hope that we'll integrate these policies into our approaches. I also hope that the data driven policies that Nevada piloted, that that can be used more broadly, right? That we can surge supplies um, when we have a heat disaster when we have a cold disaster, when we have um, a water disaster, uh, we can link these to data as well and make sure that we surge the supplies that people need, just like we can surge supplies of rapid tests and N95 masks um, and treatments if there's a COVID surge. 
I was just going to add that, you know, through the adversity was the opportunity in California and for local government to take advantage of uh, Governor Gavin Newsom's Home Key program, where we were able to uh, leverage those dollars um, to purchase uh, permanent supportive housing for vulnerable homeless populations that um, were uh, uh, more at risk of having really adverse outcomes um, if they were, um, uh, if they had COVID um, and living on the street. So I do think that, you know, um, uh, there are opportunities for us to leverage and, and build those system shifts um, that I mentioned before, such as the Home Key Project. And, and sorry, I just wanna add a few more things here as well. Um, I think that our, our food security issue is definitely a challenge in Nevada and kind of always has been. So I think working to address some of those things now um, has really helped us learn how to move forward. Um, we've actually recently announced that we're gonna continue supplementing the free and reduced lunch program by the Oh, Tim, you went on mute. Oh, sorry. All students in our K through 12 um, institutions have access to um, to food to ensure that they're they're ready to learn and able to to be successful in doing that as well. So um, we'll continue to do that for at least the next school year and looking at programs to ensure that food security is um, is of the the front and foremost um, piece that we we want to bring to the table to ensure kids are able to be successful in the schools. That's great. That's great. Uh, this is extremely helpful. I know that uh, on the federal government side, um, that is our charge to think about um, as we think about ARPA dollars or COVID relief funds and and, and future kind of federal resources, how um, we can uh, incorporate flexibilities there to make sure that we're able to use, spend some of these funds in in, uh, in more responsive ways. Uh, a lot of the time we, you know, understandably are trying to be good stewards of, of federal uh, government and have, uh, you know, congressional uh, kind of the oversight aspect of it, but we want to make sure that to the extent it makes sense for us to provide those flexibilities uh, that we are able to do that. So I know that that's certainly top of mind. It's something that we've seen with the emergency measures that we've tried to do uh, and support, um, whether in Texas or, or across the board with FEMA uh, or California, um, certainly something that we continue to uh, be mindful of and, and want to kind of advance on, on our end. Um, before we move on to the next question, which kind of gets back to, to further engagement and outreach to, to kind of constituents, um, Dr. Reifman, um, there was a question about wastewater surveillance. Um, I don't know if, sorry to hop around here a little bit, but I don't know if you have kind of just thoughts on um, on the effectiveness of, of that. Um, I know that it's been uh, kind of uh, growing um, and increasing in certain regions. I think Boston in the Northeast uh, Mid-Atlantic area is something that is kind of leading uh, the way in, with, with regards to wastewater surveillance. But I don't know. Maybe we can pause here if you have any any reactions there, and we'll continue with the, the rest of the questions after that. Yeah, I you know I think it's been really helpful, and we're really fortunate to have such a robust system here in Massachusetts. I have a lot more confidence looking at the um, the wastewater data that they have not been affected by like different kinds of testing. Uh, so I think it's really helpful for us to gauge where we are in the pandemic and one of the most reliable sources. At the same time, we still have a lot to learn about wastewater and how to make sure it is most reliable, how to make sure that we're um, sampling wastewater in communities that are most affected and uh, that are most vulnerable to not being able to have the resources they need to be able to respond. So, and I think the other thing that's very important to me about wastewater is, I, is not to just watch it go up and down, <laughs> um, you know, it's to really say, okay, I see this uptick start and this is the time to act. Um, and there have been some parts of the pandemic where, you know, I would say, oh, I see that um, there's an increase happening. I'm really concerned about what's happening. How can I help? And they would say, oh, well, like, you know, we hadn't really thought about that. We'll get back to you. And it takes a few weeks. Um, and then we can help post posters about vaccine clinics and that kind of thing. But ideally, you want to have that ready to go. Um, you want to say we're hosting a bunch of vaccine clinics, we're distributing out flyers in several languages, we're, um, you know, we're going to people where they are in the low income neighborhoods where people are not vaccinated enough, you want to have all that ready to roll out when the next surge begins. Um, Tim, or direct, uh, Director Rob or Director Robinson, any addition, anything to add there? Um, yeah, so in Nevada, we're also working to build out um, a pretty robust surveillance system within our wastewater as well. Um, and, and already looking to the other applications, so whether that's the opioid crisis that we're seeing in Nevada um, or other communicable diseases, we are working to build out the, the programs that are necessary to make sure that we have that, that data point to be able to stick to and, and understand the levels that are happening. I think one of the challenges that we've seen is, is really building that baseline and understanding what the numbers mean, but I think that we'll continue to learn 
And I think we have the right people in Nevada looking at it to, to help us build out the program that'll make most sense for a public health response going forward. And I would just add that it's important to, to make sure that you're building that uh, capacity um, collectively across jurisdictions to be able to really understand from a regional perspective uh, the impacts um, and, and the mitigation and interventions and strategies that are necessary. One other point I'll add is that um, we know that crowded indoor settings are where COVID spreads most. Um, and so we can't, we do have some canaries in the coal mine um, and we can actually really focus on that. Um, there's a new study that just came out this week showing that wastewater increased in a school before it increased in the general community. That's a crowded indoor setting where COVID spreads quickly. We also see that in a lot of workplaces. And ideally what we would see is that um, we would see increases in these places that do have um, the, the concentrated risk of COVID and COVID transmission, and then we would, um, we would trigger the response there. Because what we see in the population data too is that worker, low-income workers get COVID first and most, right? And so if we can reduce that among low-income workers, we can reduce it in the whole population, we can reduce onward transmission, we can also reduce it for the people who are least prepared to bear those costs, um, and we can all have less overwhelmed hospitals um, less overwhelmed healthcare workers, um, more families making it through those surges. Great, great. Thank you guys uh, so much for that. Um, and I see that we are now joined by uh, Mary Lorza, uh, the great city of Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I've heard plenty about Providence recently because we have our new COVID coordinator here at the White House, Dr. Ashish Jha. Uh, and so Mayor, it's great to see you. Uh, we've been talking about um, how local jurisdictions, uh, including yourself, have been uh, responding to the pandemic, but also thinking about um, kind of uh, policies that have made our communities more resilient and been responsive to kind of health disparities and equity. Um, we were uh, going to talk about um, a little bit of uh, in, in our next kind of question around um, the um, how helpful it's been to uh, interact at the various levels of government from city, county, state, uh, and, and federal. But uh, prior to that, I, I'd love to uh, lend the floor to you, Mayor. Um, thank you for joining us and any uh, kind of overall reactions on the conversation that we have here. Uh, we have a robust panel with um, our, our colleagues in Nevada uh, and Texas on the line, as well as Dr. Reifman, uh, leader of, of CUSP, uh, who've been kind of sharing some of their best uh, practices. But I'd love any any thoughts from, uh, from, from you in, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. So just to start, I want to, first of all, apologize for being late. I literally walked off the stage um, on another panel just a, just a second ago. Um, so thank you for having me here. Um, you know, I, I think the most lasting thought that comes from our city's response to the pandemic was in the early days, the uncertainty and this understanding that we were making extremely consequential decisions without having all of the information and just being uncertain as to what was what was right around the corner. And, uh, you know, we were coordinating among among mayors, um, uh, among cities, and you would see a mayor or a city make a bold decision one day that uh, if you look back on a week later, it was sort of, you know, it was a sort of, you know, the basic things that can be done. Everything was moving so quickly. And so in that environment, uh, it was really important to uh, coordinate so that you could be up to date on best practices or rather better practices as they were developing as they were developing in a, on an ongoing basis. And, uh, um, you know, I, you know I, I want I want to thank, you know, folks uh, at the federal and the federal uh, that we can make the most out of you know, what was what were extraordinarily difficult uh, times to make the decisions that work best for, for our community. Early on, um, uh, there was a great deal of uncertainty. And so no one really knew exactly where it was going and what we were doing, but there was a great deal of compliance. You could be, you could be sure of that. Um, uh, it got more difficult over time where we had a better sense of what we needed to do to control the spread of the virus but unfortunately, compliance was a lot less there. So, you know, just dealing with, I guess, this 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 irony that developed, where uh, when we were in a position to make the best recommendations and the best decisions, the public was, unfortunately, um, um, in uh, in uh, progressively less of a mood to comply with it. So it was a really challenging time, but it was really by coordinating, working together, that we could get through it and get to this point as quickly as we could. 
Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so on that coordination point, um, I'll pose the question to the, to the larger group as well. Um, how did engagement, communication, and collaboration between the people at the various levels of government uh, impact management and or the response to the COVID-19? So were there any particular aspects of the relationships that worked well for you all, uh, perhaps that, uh, that didn't, um, thinking about kind of the local, county, state, federal, et cetera, um, uh, Director Rob, uh, I'd love your thoughts, and um, and then uh, we'll go over to Director Robinson. Um, but Tim, yeah, I think that the the resources made available by the federal government was incredible and and really helped us make our way through the pandemic. Um, I also think that our partnerships with our local government also really enhanced our ability to respond, and also really just I mean made the the response possible because they were the boots on the ground. We really strive to do kind of the FEMA mantra of the locally executed, state managed and federally supported and, and push for that and make sure that we are supporting all of the levels that need to be supported. I think also a really good point to, to put here is also our, our collaboration with our NGOs, um, our nonprofit organizations within the state that really helped get the messaging out, um, really helped us with coordinating vaccination clinics, with coordinating um, testing, whatever it was needed, we, we were able to get those boots on the ground to do the work that was necessary. And it didn't matter if it was in Reno or Vegas, our two big population centers, or um, Carlin or Tonopah or any of the places that you guys have probably never heard of in Nevada that, um, that also need those resources and, and re really needed access to um, the things that maybe they didn't have in other responses as well. Awesome. Thank you, Director uh, Rob. Um, Director Robinson, uh, things that worked well in collaboration, but also to play a little bit of devil's advocate, uh, things that maybe didn't, communication and collaboration that was challenging. I uh, would love any thoughts there as well. Yeah, I think uh, having spent 15 years at the federal level at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, I understand all too well the importance of having strong collaborative relationships um, between local, state, and federal government. Um, and so I, I think in terms of um, in uh, some of the things that didn't work well in the beginning, right, was coming up, you know, feds coming up with strategies, policies, communications without uh, gathering the input at, from the state and the local level. And it was through those challenges that we were able to strengthen our relationships because we we're able to say, hey, that's not the reality here on the ground locally, um, or we need more of X and less of Y. Um, and so from that perspective, I believe we were able to strengthen our relationships because we were able to share that information up through the state and have that information get back up to the feds in order to um, more effectively uh, be responsive to those interventions and strategies that were necessary. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Director Reifman, or, or Dr. Reifman? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it, the reality is it's a very um, challenging time for people. It's a very polarized time, and there are some who are kind of intent on sowing division. Uh, and in a pandemic, the way we get through it is really to come together. Um, when each of us affects so many other people, if we get COVID, we can infect several others. The only way to overcome that is not something any individual can do. It's only something that we can do through collective action to protect ourselves and each other. Um, and we really need leadership to do that. Uh, and it's also really hard for leaders to implement that in this polarized environment. So I, one of the things I really loved was seeing how California counties came together to develop a standard together. Um, and you know, I think that's what we need to see more of. I think that that's still something that can happen in cities and counties to say, next time there's a surge that's like BA1, what would we like to have in place to prepare for that from a policy perspective? And how can we work together to, um, to implement those strong policies together um, and, and really take a stand to say, you know, like we know this is hard, it's temporary, and it's not as hard as, as what's going to happen during the surge. Um, this will reduce those surge harms. It will help more families make it through the next several weeks intact. Um, so I, I think that people can band together to make those hard decisions. Um, you know, I also have really appreciated the policy leadership of states that have made some of those hard decisions that are planning to mandate vaccines in schools, just like we do for uh, several other vaccines. The states that have mandated boosters um, before the Omicron surge, you know, that was really important. They mandated them for healthcare workers, and that helped ensure that more healthcare workers were able to be there to care for patients. We saw that fewer people missed work when they were boosted. So these policies make a difference. I know they're really hard, but I hope that by coming together, we can implement them. We can take care of each other through this and, and all that's to come. 
If I could just add to, to uh, you, Dr. What, uh, what Juliet uh, mentioned, having come from a region where we banded together um, in the Bay Area and developed orders uh, together and in concert and coordinated that, um, it was challenging, right, to try to hold your hold the line at a local level without state and federal backing and support. And so uh, to your point, I do think that it's really important to get that support um, for um, you know, those, those challenging and controversial measures um, at a higher level of government to help support local, local government being able to implement them. Because at various points, um, you know, that, that regional um, stance fell apart because of some of the challenges and dynamics depending on which local jurisdiction you were in. And just to drive Director Robinson's point home, um, I think we really did do it as best as we could at the state level to ensure that we gave the cover to the local jurisdictions that needed it um, to implement the things that were necessary to protect the public. That's great. Um, I, I certainly know, and I'll, I'll turn it over to the, the mayor as well, but I was going to acknowledge and thank everyone on this line because I know that mayors across the country were connecting with one another. I know Director Robinson, Director Rob, we were sharing, but I was, a lot of our job was connecting jurisdictions on, on what your approaches were, um, whether it was vaccine outreach and education or uh, just mitigation approaches and, and whatnot. So uh, it, it's been a real pleasure to see jurisdictions really kind of lean on each other, uh, not only regionally, but across the country uh, and be partners in that, in that sense. Um, but uh, Mayor uh, Lorge, I know you were uh, uh, unmuting there. Yeah, I, I, I just want to add my voice to this point. And yes, the coordination with um, other municipal governments, but also other levels of government here in, here in our, our state was extremely helpful, especially when, you know, a certain fatigue to, to, um, to COVID mitigation measures took hold. Um, and being able to coordinate with the state and, uh, and, move, and move jointly made all the difference and allowed us to it, it, it not only gave political cover, but it also lent more weight to the decisions that we, uh, that we were making. And so, so that was extremely, extremely helpful. Um, maybe this is obvious, some things that didn't go well. Um, early on, um, the disjointed federal message, you know, having medical professionals say one thing and then have that be undermined by the president who is not helpful. Um, and uh, you know, to go along with that, you know the uh, the local level. That's where that's where the rubber meets the road, and where the services and the needs are met. And uh, while a lot of attention is paid on politics and decision making at the federal level, as it as it should, I do also believe that not enough uh, attention and uh, and thought is put to politics and decisions at the local level. And uh, you know, one example of that was the first. Uh, was the first uh, COVID relief effort, right? The uh, the CRF funds, uh, the way that they were, the way that the funding was allocated, 100% of those funds came to the state, and they did go to some cities, cities over 500,000. But that excludes thousands of cities throughout the throughout the country, and many cities to this day, you know, never saw one cent of those uh, CRF dollars. And uh, so, so working forward, more of an appreciation. Uh, of, uh, of the work that's done at the local level in meeting communities and meeting the needs um, you know, right in the neighborhoods and, and where they're at is something that should be should be changed going forward. Great, great. Thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. It actually kind of leads uh, very well into our next question, which is uh, on outreach um, and, and tools to kind of engage with uh, residents and, and, and constituents. Uh, we spoke about this a little bit earlier this afternoon, but um, we'd love to kind of come back to the question of what successful tools, tactics, and approaches were used to communicate with uh, your constituents and re uh, residents uh, about the COVID policies? Um, uh, Dr. Reifman, you just mentioned how um, a lot of our state leaders made these tough decisions to re-implement various mitigation measures, but I know that even just politically that always, uh, wasn't always the easiest thing to do, and we're kind of, given the fatigue, folks were not uh, kind of able to kind of reinstitute um, a, a variety of different uh, mitigation measures, but I'd love to kind of just pose the question to the group and uh, maybe uh, Mr. Mayor, we can come back to you here on just what was the most effective way to communicate uh, what we needed to with our constituents and reaching kind of those folks, if we can build on kind of getting to folks where they're at. So it's a little bit of, a little bit of everything. Um, you know, again, I'm sorry if this is just overly obvious, but um, when, when COVID hit, that's when the Zoom revolution took took hold. And so we knew that 
we knew that COVID was having a, a disproportionate impact on, um, on communities of color, low-income communities. But Zoom uh, truly opened up a new way that we can communicate directly with our, with our constituents. And something that we did here in Providence that frankly we've continued to this day is uh, we've brought together groups of ambassadors. Uh, we had a Latino ambassador group, we had an African-American ambassador group, we had a you know, faith leader amb ambassador group. And I was able to get on Zoom with them um, sometimes multiple times a week and just share with them the latest information, get, uh, get feedback directly from them, and then um, you know, ask folks on my team to, uh, to address whatever concerns were, uh, were, being, were being raised. And I know that Zoom doesn't solve all of the challenges. There's still a lot of communities out there that, that, that need to be met. Uh, but Zoom really did open up this incredible, incredible opportunity uh, to engage with communities uh, whose voices are, are typically left out. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention, uh, the, or the, you know, the next thing that I'll mention is uh, direct outreach with community-based organizations. So yes, perhaps there, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that were dedicated towards food insecurity and getting food into the hands of people that need them. But perhaps many of the providers out there, they didn't have refrigeration or they didn't have transportation or, you know, getting that you know, real time feedback from folks who are directly on the ground was invaluable. And I think that, you know, the higher up you go in levels of government, the more difficult it is to receive that information. Um, but making sure that, you know, you, you keep your ear to the ground and you give voice to people who are often overlooked, uh, that was essential to our response. Thank you. Um, Director Robinson, uh, I know that uh, we look to Harris County often as your uh, dashboard and data transparent, like just uh, the information and data that you guys regularly provide. Um, any, any thoughts here on how that um, or just overall strategies that have been effective in communicating with, uh, with yeah, residents? Yeah, I definitely think that, you know, having, having uh, our dashboard and the threat level system was essential to being able to educate the community about COVID and educate members and, and sectors of the communities that previously may not have had access to this information or um, had the opportunity to um, learn it or understand it. And so it was important and powerful to have that as a tool um, that we were able to use to galvanize other messaging and communications. I will say since you know March of, of 2020, we've had 1.8 million contacts in um, underserved communities and with vulnerable populations. And it was really critical and important to partner with those trusted community-based partners, whether it was for education around the mitigation measures or trying to galvanize and, and get folks out to get vaccinated. So I will say that, you know, that that was really critical and important. Um, those relationships, um, you know, uh, being able to uh, create um, greater trust and strengthen trust in government to, to, to move the needle on our efforts. Great, thank you. Um, and before I turn to uh, Director Rob, I'd love your thoughts. I know that uh, we've tried everything under the sun in terms of, as we think about pediatric vaccinations, we've done superheroes, we've done uh, uh, you know Muppets uh, and other kind of catchy um, uh, branding and marketing and different kind of creative um, kind of ways to reach folks. I know Nevada certainly has led both with boots on the ground, but also in, in your various approaches. I would love to kind of hear um, your thoughts on, on this and how we reach people where they're at. Yeah, so definitely. I think um, it's it's a really great program that FEMA helped us um, with our mobile vaccination units early on in the vaccination process. Um, and that really met those folks in our rural communities where they are. Um, I think that there was some challenges there and in, in how it was executed, but I think we learned from those as well and have only built even stronger um, points of distribution for the vaccination efforts going forward. Um, we continue to build out our public health infrastructure and those that are available to vaccinate um, in our rural communities, as well as in our urban centers. And I think that that's a really important thing to be continuing. And I think that part of our messaging on the um, six months and older component is also to get in touch with your trusted medical provider. Um, I think that that's something that we're really gonna be working to drive home and, and push people to their pediatrician um, and their trusted healthcare providers to um, really help them get the information they need to make the decision to vaccinate their children. Um, at those younger age groups, in addition to anyone that has not received their, um, their doses of the vaccination and boosters um, and the other age groups. Um, I think that we'll continue to, to adapt our communication strategies as we see what's working and maybe what's not. 
Um, and I think that that'll continue to be a, a very important piece to our longevity within the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Reifman, any other thoughts there? Um, again, I, I think of Boston and the region as really kind of leading um, in, in multiple uh, aspects of it, but I, I know that certainly just kind of the, from your perspective and your purview, um, thoughts there on, on what you've seen uh, as effective? Yeah, well, and one, I'm so glad that you brought up kids because um, unfortunately we do see that more kids under age 11 are not vaccinated than are vaccinated. So we still have a lot of work to do. We also have a lot of work to do on vaccinating and boosting their parents and grandparents. So, um, and more of the US population needs a shot in their arm, whether it's a booster or a vaccine um, than not. So in that sense, like continuing the work to do broad vaccination is really important for the United States to be prepared for future surges. Um, you know, I think there's um, there are a few misconceptions, you know, that the pandemic is over um, or that the pandemic is that COVID is not harmful to kids um, or that vaccines are unnecessary if somebody has been infected. Um, and I, I think it's really important to let people know, you know, BA1 actually killed a record number of children. Um, so I'm really concerned about BA4 and 5 and the coming surge and what it might do to the kids who are not yet vaccinated. Um, we see that um, while Massachusetts you know, has an overall high rate of vaccination, our lowest income communities in, in Massachusetts remain really far behind. Um, and so we have to pair that communications with delivery um, and, and making it easily accessible to people. We've also seen that people who speak other languages have often only heard misinformation. They've heard that the vaccine might affect um, their um, reproductive potential or, or some kind of misinformation like that. That is not true. Um, and what it is important for people to know is that, um, that the vaccines are much safer than getting COVID and, um, and will reduce the chances of severe outcomes. Um, and at this point, most people are getting COVID, getting COVID reinfections, and we really want to protect them as well as possible. We also know that the vaccines aren't fully protective. And so really, ideally, we want layered mitigation um, where people have vaccines and masks, uh, ideally mask mandates during surges. Um, so that they're not really um, relying on that vaccine to protect them, at, which it does um, reduce their chances, but doesn't eliminate their chances of severe outcomes and long COVID. Great, great. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, next, we'll move to kind of questions from the audience. Again, uh, to the attendees, um, feel free to drop any questions in the chat box, uh, any reactions. Um, as, as we do that, i um, love to kind of just speak about, um, you know, uh, how our whole of government approach, whether it's the HHS, the CDC, kind of our team here at the White House, we've certainly welcome any feedback. We've been looking to jurisdictions on, on enhancing our pandemic response to COVID-19, but overall, as we think about monkeypox and other efforts, um, you all have been great um, thought leaders and partners in sharing kind of feedback and, and uh, ways to enhance. Uh, as you guys um, are well aware, uh, our biggest um, kind of channel for vaccination efforts has been through um, the federal pharmacy partners. So this is the CVS, Walgreens, uh, the Giants, you, you, you know, the, the, our, our partners across the, the country, uh, but also our FQHCs, our, our federally uh, qualified health centers um, and community health centers. And so we've seen that that has actually been um, really kind of helpful uh, to reaching folks um, kind of in those, um, you know, specific underserved um, uh, neighborhoods, um, pharmacies, we like to say, uh, are within five miles of any, or, or most folks, if, if, if we look at the majority of the country, are able to access vaccines at their pharmacies, but certainly uh, jurisdictional partners with um, county and state-run uh, vaccination efforts have been extremely helpful. So we hope to, to be able to engage all of those, uh, particularly to your point, Dr. Rafman, as we think about uh, further encouraging um, vaccines for children now that they're available for kids under five as well. So um, and just, I guess, a, a long way of saying thank you for being great partners and we welcome any feedback uh, or further thoughts on how uh, the federal effort is going. We're certainly always open to that. Um, all right, well, actually, Dr. Reifen, maybe this is a question you can kick us off with because uh, it is related to what factors position some municipalities, counties, and cities uh, to be more resilient than others as we think about the pandemic response. I know there's a variety of different uh, you know, variables here, but uh, what are your thoughts on, on how some uh, jurisdictions ended up being more resilient than others? Yeah, well, you know, I think, think going forward, thinking about resilience, like vaccine and booster rates are really your, your resilience, like equity is, is your resilient, resilience and having a plan for surges, like the, the vast majority of deaths are happening during surges, the other harms to the economy, to service disruptions, those are really concentrated in surges. And so having a surge response plan 
um, is, is really what sets you up to manage COVID well. You know, I think also making sure that you're really focused on those lowest income communities that are hit hardest by COVID and by its economic ramifications. Um, so having paid sick leave, um, I, I know that Massachusetts is considering a child tax credit um, in addition to the expanded child tax credit being considered at the federal level. You know, really thinking about how to keep families, especially families with children, um, out of poverty, um, because it, we do see that um, there continue to be much higher rates of child food insufficiency even now, um, and that it's increasing with inflation. Um, it's increasing as so many low-income families are missing work due to COVID. Uh, and a lot of those programs to support people have gone away while the pandemic continues. So um, really uh, protecting people who are facing the worst consequences uh, remains quite important. Um, and, you know, I think, I think the federal government has the most financial capacity to do that. And so, I, you know, I hope we'll see the federal government support those longer term resilience strategies as well. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, any thoughts there on, on some cities were more resilient than others? So I don't know if this is backed by, um, you know, by, by, by research data, but anecdotally, I have to imagine that the, that the um, cities that were most resilient were the ones that had higher levels of social co cohesion to begin with. And uh, what I mean by that, we've seen with natural disasters here, here and um, in other places that the formal emergency response that gets, uh, or the, those resources get used up pretty quickly. And so who fills in the rest of that void? Um, you know, the number of volunteers that you have uh, that, that step up and the systems that you have in place to integrate them into the relief efforts, that's critical. But then also the neighbors helping neighbors concept. Um, if you know that there's an elderly, elderly uh, neighbor who needs help, um, reaching out to Meals on Wheels for them or somehow making, making the connection. So, you know, that, that was especially important because we know that COVID disconnected so many, so many of us from each other. That contact didn't exist, but um, to the extent that, you know, our neighbors were checking in on each other, that people who wanted to help could be integrated into formal relief efforts. I think uh, those are the places that emerged from this or emerged from the most critical moments of this um, in the strongest positions. That's great. Thank you for that, Mayor. Um, Director Robinson, you've been in California and you transitioned over to Texas in the midst of this. Uh, any any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, the mayor in, in the context of community relationships and uh, the more, um, you know, uh, the lower the social vulnerability index score, right? There's uh, the outcomes were much better or your vaccine uptake uh, perhaps much better. Um, and as I've started this conversation talking about the importance of addressing the social determinants of health, um, really it enables us to have uh, better um, outcomes and better response during, um, you know, uh, the disasters such as a pandemic, right, or any other natural disaster. And so uh, for me, it's just really emphasizing the importance of investments in communities to help create those communities um, in those parts of um, uh, our jurisdiction that um, where we're seeing the vulnerability and the lack of infrastructure and the lack of resources there to start making those investments now so that in the future, right, we're, we're living in the era of climate change. Um, and I know, you know, comparing my experience to California and Texas, and I'm happy to be in Texas. I'm where I'm supposed to be in order to advance this work. Um, you know, and there's lessons learned and opportunities, um, but there are also still um, some you know, some of the same disparities and outcomes exist in both places, which speaks to the need to make the investments um, in those community, those low income communities or underserved communities. Thank you. Director Rob, thoughts there? Yeah, so in addition to everything that everyone has said, I think that really one of the biggest benefits that we've seen throughout the pandemic is building those relationships with all of our partners across the state, whether they are in the public sector, private sector, um, I, I think that building on those and really helping them find a voice in informing our strategies moving forward and talking about and with the people that are impacted by each decision that we make is going to be super helpful going forward. Um, I think that really we got to take those learnings from the pandemic, um, take the highlights that have been seen in those long-term disparities that everyone in public health has known about for some time, but now the public is aware 
and and really taking that momentum and doing something with it is going to be important. Um, we can't soon forget all of the challenges that we've had. And um, I think that that's part of our mission is to, to push forward and make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure that those aren't as big of deals in the next response that we may see. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, okay, well, we uh, don't have any questions uh, in the chat box here, but maybe what we can do here is um, kind of to, as we start to kind of wrap, uh, would love to do kind of maybe just a rapid uh, a round of, of response to, um, as we think about uh, kind, kind of going back to the pandemic and with, uh, as Dr. Rafe mentioned at, at the top, with BA4, BA5, you know, it's been so unpredictable, uh, COVID-19, that we don't know what come the future is going to bring. Uh, we'll try, uh, you know, our best to, to be prepared. Um, we certainly are doing that at the federal government with our jurisdictional partners, um, but would love kind of the group's thoughts on any good examples of, of a model policy that, that you guys, um, the one comes, comes to mind uh, that we can kind of um, you know, take away from this conversation as um, something we can turn on or off based on, on COVID uh, rising cases or falling. I know we touched a little bit about this, but um, again, just do a, a rapid round of um, kind of uh, responses here and see what, what is that one policy that we should think of and have top of mind as we head into the fall, for instance, with, with, uh, with this pandemic. Um, why don't I start kind of backwards here and Director Rob, we'll go, we'll go to you first. That was great. I think that it's really elevating those voices that are necessary and making sure we have those things in place. Um, so listening to our public health officials, um, continuing to make sure we're, we're taking progress in um, making sure we're building resilient communities. Um, and I think that really just data-driven decision-making should be the foundation of a lot of the things we do and providing the least restrictive environment possible, but also doing all we can to protect the, the people that we serve and, um, and the visitors to the great state of Nevada. Great, thank you. Director Robinson? I would say strengthening our data-driven approaches and so policies that support um, uh, utilizing the data um, and continuing to support um, and strengthening um, the, the a power at the local level to be able to implement um, those strategies and interventions based on the data-driven approach. And I think um, uh, Julia mentioned it earlier, right? Uh, uh, you know, consistency around mandates for vaccine for kids, right? Having that parity between other vaccines and the COVID vaccine, that this is our new normal and, and we need to protect our children in much the same way we do for other um, infectious diseases. Great, great. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thoughts there? The one policy comes to top of mind? Yeah, uh, COVID fatigue is real. Um, I think that most of the general public would rather just be done with this entirely and move on to what's next. Um, but we're very concerned about surges into surges into the future. And so I would say an important policy for all of us to, to promote is to just remind the public that you know, we're not out of it now. Uh, we're at a low or we're at a low point, uh, but there's, there are a lot of mitigation steps that we can and need to, need to take so that it continues to stay on people's mind. And so that hopefully, um, if and when the next surge comes, uh, we, um, uh, uh, we don't have to reawaken the public to COVID being in our community again, but it's part of our, you know, part of their continuous, uh, continuing understanding of the steps they need to take to keep themselves and their community safe. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Reifman, thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm so glad to hear from my co-panelists because my thoughts really echo a lot of what they have said. Um, you know, but I, I think that Nevada had a model, model policy, the Bay Area had a model policy that they were data-driven policies. And I think those are really good policies to use as a model more broadly. Um, you know, I also think it's hard politically, right? Like we hear that. And so um, I think it's important for um, political figures to recognize that yes, there is an upfront cost to acknowledging that the pandemic continues and that it continues to be harmful and that we all wish it was done, but it's still here. Um, but I think that ultimately um, we have a, a much less cost to health, to society, to the economy. Um, if we really strengthen our institutions, this is a time when we need stronger institutions in our government. We really strengthen the ability for health institutions to share what we see um, with, without any rose-colored glasses and, um, and share what it is that we can do. 
going forward. Um, that will help us um, be stronger together going through it. And I, I hope we can maintain that focus on not dividing along any lines, but recognizing we have to support each other and getting vaccinated and wearing masks and surges um, and helping to keep kids out of poverty as, as all of this continues, keep everyone out of poverty um, and, uh, and, and have, uh, have the next few years look better than the past few years. Great, great. Thank you for that. Well, this has been a really robust and helpful conversation. We thank uh, all our panelists. Uh, I'll just pause here. Uh, we are, um, you know, we, we do have a, a few more minutes, but um, I, we could also uh, give folks back uh, some time and recognize everyone is uh, very busy. But uh, before doing that, I'd want to just kind of pause. Any final thoughts, parting thoughts, uh, Director Robinson, uh, Director Rob, and, uh, and then we'll turn to uh, uh, Mr. Mayor Elorza. Why is it, uh, parting thoughts, uh, Director Robinson? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I, I would just say, um, you know, uh, echo all of the great comments and feedback that uh, the other panelists shared. Um, uh, it, I recognize there's COVID fatigue. However, we're in a lot of respects, we're just beginning to run the race for our, our kids and we need to stay the course and encourage and continue to support and make investments and prioritize supporting, um, you know, vaccination for our children as we move forward. Thank you for that. Uh, Director Rob? Yes, I think uh, in parting, I think it's just incredible to, to be a part of this conversation. And I think this conversation needs to expand to include as many as possible. Um, and I think that the, co the collaboration between state, local and federal partners um, has been a huge asset to our response and something that we should continue going forward in everything that we do. Um, I think building um, even stronger relationships, but I think that the pandemic has given us that opportunity to build those relationships pretty strong. Um, but continuing that momentum and doing what we can to provide the best services and responses to any challenge going forward is going to be um, first and foremost our uh, our push here in Nevada. So thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Party thoughts. So uh, to um, to to add to all my fellow pal panelists. Um, you know, I really appreciate that we're having this conversation right now. Um, let's stay let's stay vigilant, and uh, you know this is a bit of a sort of cue in my mind to um, uh, turn around and have these conversations with with our ambassador groups here here locally. So uh, we will we will indeed do that. Um, that's one, and then and then second, um, uh, doing what we can to. Um, uh, support those systems that uh, sometimes informal, but systems that um, rose up to be part of the response, making sure that we nurture them, we support them so that if and when the next crisis appears and uh, they don't have to be built up again from scratch, but are already uh, ready to function and deploy as necessary. Great, thank you. And Dr. Reifman, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you close us out with, um, if you want to talk on CUSP or, or just kind of, I saw you sharing your email address earlier today in terms of how you've been helping uh, jurisdictions and our resource to folks, as well as with Evidence for Action. Um, uh, uh, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you. I, th I think this is such a hopeful conversation. You know, I hope everyone here feels empowered to implement the policies that really do make a difference for people, empowered to come together to have more conversations with other cities, with the state and federal level about how everyone can support each other um, in setting, um, setting out reasonable policies, right, for this longer term future of COVID. Um, and, uh, and I found this conversation really inspiring and kind of um, leading us into the next phase. Um, about how we get through things together. So um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And, and thank you to these fantastic panelists here. That's right. Uh, on behalf of Evidence for Action, the National League of Cities, uh, on behalf of the administration, thank you for, to, you know, for joining us. And uh, thank you to our, our speakers and, and participants. Uh, we covered a lot. Uh, but this isn't the end. We want to keep the conversation going. So please uh, reach out to uh, Evidence for Action uh, and, um, and their email address is evidenceforaction at ucsf.edu. I'm sure we'll drop that in the, in the chat box here as well. Uh, please take a moment to complete the post um, uh, event survey, which will be sent around as well. Um, you can expect to see um, the post event follow up uh, email in your inboxes. Uh, in the sh in short order, recapping today's conversation and also just some highlights. Um, and as a reminder, this was uh, recorded, so you can uh, certainly come 
to come back to this. Uh, but again, on behalf of the group, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to be able to give you guys some uh, minutes back to your afternoon and appreciate our panelists in particular. Uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Great to see you all. Take care. Thank you. And thank you to our, our host.